So uh, we're going to kick it off. Let me just get a time check. I actually, perfect, it's 3.08, so not too late. I, uh, I didn't time this presentation, so if we finish early, um, maybe we could do some Q&A. I could also do a demo. Um, I was actually going to get up here and do a demo, but we staged our application live last week on Rink B Testnet, so you guys can all go play with it yourself. Um, yeah, so music in Ethereum. Um, I'm Jack Spallone. I'm with Ujo Music, which is a consensus application, or yeah, consensus application we'll call ourselves. A um, little closer. Going to be talking about a constant tale of building towards decentralization versus going to market. Uh, it's been plaguing a lot of applications in this space for the past four years. So I'm, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the music business as it's pretty important as it relates to Ethereum, and a lot of that context is, is necessary to understand where the, the intersection is. Um, so we're going to talk about three pillars of decentralization as they relate to music, the value of Ethereum, and what it can bring to music. Um, and then at that point, I'll give a little bit of background on music royalties and the copyright structure and licensing. Um, and then from there, I'll give a brief history of Ujo, uh, what we've done, where we've been, where Ujo fits into music, um, what we're doing now, and what hope to uh, do in the future. So, yeah, so quick, um, Ujo has been around for almost four years. It was, uh, it was in, it was, it's, <laughs> it's been around for almost four years and still in a space that's in its pre-infancy. Um, we have yet to scratch the surface of what can be done, uh, but we've built a lot to get there. So uh, hopefully I'll get a little bit into that today. My background. Um, as an undergrad, I created a blog in college that aggregated all the local events. Instead of going around and finding where events, or what events were where, um, I decided, why doesn't someone just make a blog that has all the events at all the different uh, venues chronological? I learned really quickly about uh, paid placements and media bias, and was like, oh, this is crap. <laughs> so I sold the blog, got rid of it. I left the music industry. I wanted nothing to do with it. It lacked professionalism, um, what have you. Um, then one of the promoters came to me and was like, hey, I really liked what you did, and we want to beef up our digital promotions. Would you want to get into talent buying? And I was like, that sounds really enticing. I would love to be working with agents. That sounds like a little bit more established than what I was doing prior. So I got into that, and then uh, a few months after that, I ended up uh, losing a lot of money on a show, and I broke even on all my profits to date. So I decided I'm out of the music industry, and that was the second time I did that. Um, about six months after that, someone reached out to me and was like, hey, I want to manage artists. Would you want to like, come and like, help me out with a lot of their digital representation? Um, at the time, we brought an artist over from Australia to Orlando, Florida, where I was living, and we paid for this, this kid to have an artist visa, and we were able to get him on Hype Machine every single time by just getting him on all the blogs that Hype Machine tracked. Hype Machine, back in like blog house days, was the largest syndicate of like up and coming music. And we just had a formula for getting on Hype Machine and getting Hype Machine number ones every single time. Um, six months later, we signed uh, the second artist who started managing to Sony Music. And to me, it was like a, a loss of the creative direction that we wanted to maintain. And I was pretty bitter about it. Um, so I started thinking like, one, I really, really, really hate the music industry. I've now left it three times. Um, <laughs> but it was a good lens to look at uh, through Bitcoin, because through like curation and financing um, and, and potentially programming licenses um, and fanship and patronage for that matter, Bitcoin provided a really, really cool global solution to a lot of the problems in both curation, discovery, and other problems I saw in music. So um, enough about me. Let's talk about decentralization in music. Um, a little quicker here. So there's three main pillars, um, and this is how I want to put it. Um, we often think or say that the internet broke the music industry. That's just absolutely not true. Peer-to-peer -peer technology broke the music industry, uh, specifically with Napster. Um, as the music business relates to music, it was peer-to-peer -peer technology that first uprooted the supply chain and its businesses, as we know it. This happened with the creation of Napster. Um, distribution of music in 1999 was a $15 billion market globally. Uh, dominated by CDs and dependent on an enormous amount of physical infrastructure. This was like retail stores, trucks, actual like uh, manufacturing plants for printing CDs, right? It was a huge business um, and it largely was just wiped out overnight by Napster. 
Um, but that was incomplete. As peer-to-peer -peer networks abolished the entire business of music um, via disruption or via distribution, they didn't enable sufficient infrastructure for payments to thrive in a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer way. So here we are, almost 20 years later, music industry has largely, as we knew it then, been destroyed, but um, we think we have something now, right? Um, so from 1999 to 2009, recorded music sales and licensing revenue fell from what, $15 billion to right around $6 billion. Uh, that's a massive wipeout, right? Um, Ad-supported streaming, uh, such as Pandora, YouTube, and Spotify, helped bring that back up, uh, but there was still a lot of issues with that, and I'll get into that. Uh, these companies were not built, up, built on peer-to-peer -peer networks either. That's important to note. These were just, it was conventional centralized architecture. So I'll make a point about how you know, as a fan, you might go on MySpace Music back in 2004, follow a couple artists, create a couple playlists, MySpace goes down, you lose all of that connection. Then you go over to YouTube, you do the same thing. You follow a couple artists on like Vivo, then that doesn't really become popular and SoundCloud becomes popular. You lose all those connections. So do the artists. You go on SoundCloud, you lose all those connections now because Spotify. And this is going to keep happening unless we actually have something underpinning all of this in that relationship. So meanwhile, the music business played a reactionary game, not an innovative one, never has, and it hasn't yet to date. There's been like exploration, but the music industry itself has had to play a reactionary game because you know there's punks out there that will just disrupt it very easily. Um, BitTorrent pushed the envelope of distribution, uh, put the two remaining, but the two remaining pillars and a technical solution for a new music ecosystem remained absent. That's where Ethereum comes in. So this whole like theory of blockchain for music largely uh, enters as streaming takes off. So for the one time, uh, for the first time, we have this huge disparity of what artists know their music is being, like how much their music is being played, but how much they're actually getting paid. So like with iTunes, you have digital downloads with CDs, you have actual sales, tangible sales, your, your record can go platinum and you know that, but for the first time you can say, holy shit, my music has been played a million times this week yet I'm getting paid less than ever. So artists call, call foul, particularly songwriters call foul, um, and meanwhile, blockchain's sitting there like this huge theoretical solution. Um, Adele, best album of the year, 25, never let it on Spotify. Taylor Swift revokes her catalog off Spotify. Um, streaming was the villain, right? Smart contracts, meanwhile, are like this huge solution for royalties, a theoretical one, but just like a glaring example of what's possible. Um, this was just the start. So Ethereum put forth the greatest tool for reimagining the relationship between musicians and fans that technology has ever provided. This isn't a solution of just royalty payments, this is fan and artist interactions. And that's really where this started to become powerful and, and really became interesting. So since 2014, the music business's attention on blockchain as a solution has come way ahead of schedule. The development, though, has not. But uh, let, let, let's step away from like decentralization of music. Uh, what's important is to understand like the legal frameworks and licensing for this, because that that really kind of justifies how complicating this all is. So a song is two pieces of copyright. You have the recording and a composition. So recordings like the tangible medium. Think analog era, like vinyl, CDs. It's much easier to think about all of this stuff through. Um, recordings like the actual recorded work done in a studio. The composition is the actual written song, like the sheet music. Um, this has become increasingly blurred, but these are typically managed by two different parties and have different licensing frameworks. So in America, I will use America as an example. I'm from the US, um, and America is rarely ever less complicating than anywhere else. Um, with few exceptions, so it's a good example. Um, basically, you have one side collecting one, one royalty and another collecting the other. Um, the recording is licensable. There's royalties based on the consent decree, statutory rates uh, for the composition. So this is, this is pretty straightforward, right? Um, as it relates to streaming, though, there are two royalties. We have a blanket license and a mechanical license. Depending on what kind of application you are, you have to pay both. 
Um, so for a blanket license, that's like a broadcast. Think like radio, venue, retail stores, restaurants. That all comes from the analog era. You would pay like a blanket license to a performing rights society via like an annual subscription, and then they, based on a market share, would distribute royalties. That was like just out of sake of convenience at the time in an analog era. It was too much paperwork to actually go down, hunt down set lists of what actually is being played. Uh, there's a lot of problems there, but it worked effectively. People were satisfied. Um, on the other hand, you have mechanical licenses. This is the right to reproduce. Not a right to reproduce, but a royalty you owe every single time you reproduce something. There was a lawsuit with Pandora on whether or not actually streaming a song is reproducing it, and it turns out that a stream is a reproduction, which now just makes this increasingly complicating. So as it relates to different licenses, there are different rates. There's interactive and non-interactive. Uh, interactive is easy. It's like a deliberate selection of music on Spotify. Like, I want to play this song. Non-interactive, it's passively listening to it via, like, you know, the Genome Project on Pandora, right? Still pretty straightforward. Make sense? So the rates are predicated on how you access that music. Are you subsidized or are you not subsidized? There's actually different royalty rates on whether or not you are a paying user, say $10 a month, or whether or not you have a 14-day free trial or have ads supporting that actual uh, consumption. So this is, this is still easy. You can kind of follow it back up and see where the different royalty rates are. So did I skip ahead? Yeah. So. This leaves out like other countries. So I'm an American. Let's say that someone picks up my recording, they get the, the rights to it, and they play it in South Africa, or let's say France. So is SESAM going to pay me, the, the Performing Rights Society here? No. That's called neighboring rights. I would actually have to have a publisher or a management team that is registered in France so that I can make that money back. Add more complexity to this. The different exchange rates for this. This is like we're dealing with over 100 currencies as it relates to uh, collecting societies across the globe. When you want to trace all this back, it usually takes long periods of time. Um, I actually had insight that a major label likes neighboring rights because they leave money in certain countries and gain interest on it. They're running a credit business. They're not really in the music business, right? Um, so it's sort of problematic. It's like we have this assumption that, hey, we could solve, solve all of this for you. And then we find out, like, no, we actually make a lot of money on gaining interest on holding that money where we do. Okay. So two forms of copyright, two royalties that relate to streaming, two modes of consumption, all of which has to be paid through different parties at different rates. This still sound like a fun problem to solve. Yeah, so um, what this results in is more of the confusion. Slow to move supply chain, legal red tapes, and opaque licensing deals have become the norm. Artists not getting paid is an overused blatant statement. So let's forget that. How much more can artists get paid if we start to break down these obstacles? And better yet, how many new artists could start to get paid if we just eliminate all these obstacles altogether? Like if I'm just someone who now uses digital instruments in my bedroom and want to put something up on SoundCloud, I'm sure as hell not going to use a manager, a publisher to go around to every single country and sign me up with the collecting society in that respective place. It just doesn't make sense. Yet we're in a digital world and we don't have this infrastructure. So that all is, you know, pretty boring and cumbersome, right? Let's, let's, let's use a metaphor because I think it's important to bring it back. We're not necessarily talking about a commodity. Uh, music is a lot like food. Um, I actually love this metaphor. Um, unlike, you know, the music business and it has its put out, think of music like food. Sure, it's a commodity in some places, but it's also something you can create in your own home for your family, right in front of them, live, and serve them. It's a cultural piece of artifact. Every different region has their own different tastes, their own different styles. Everyone has their own interpretation of it. Everyone has their own intentions with it. Certainly, it's like, you know, big business, but at the same time, is the big business obstru obstructing the actual consumption of it on a cultural level. Think like GMOs in America, agribusiness in America. Think about that like the music business and like, you know, an organic local farm to table farmer as someone who's just jamming out. Let's not forget that this is something that's ubiquitous across humanity. It's important. 
So you're probably wondering where Ujo fits into all of this. So I'll give you a brief history. Um, in 2014, Ujo was like a music platform idea with the conception of consensus. So founded by Joe Lubin along with consensus, um, there was this idea that given the obvious nature of smart contracts applying to royalties, Ethereum's a great, or music is a great use case for Ethereum. So at the time it was like, all right, let's, let's build towards this idea of an entirely shared world computer that everything fluidly operates on. Um, we were not actually making any compromises on architecture. We weren't looking to like stage a front end using a you know normal database, none of that. Um, it was like, let's use Ethereum for everything and let's actually just build along the trajectory in which the development of Ethereum happens. So this is that struggle of going to market versus building towards decentralization. So we were sourcing ideas, talking to people, getting other ideas, people were coming in and coming out, talk, giving like, you know, different use cases and the ideas were just endless. To everything from like financing events to ticketing events, everything around music, people wanted to use blockchain for it. Who knew it would blow up even more? So fast forward to 2015, continued ideating, planning, more a lot of that, brought some people in. Um, at DEF CON 1 in November in China, uh, the Koala IP working group formed with Simon de Louvier, who's an Ujo and Consensus member. Basically it was like, how can we take um, copyright and legal frameworks and migrate them into schemas that work in a content addressable network? A lot of what we were talking about was solving a lot of the music industry's problems, like you know, actually settling the differences of who owns what on the composition and recording side. Wasn't necessarily a problem that needed blockchain, but maybe something that just needed to move into like an object-oriented storage network. It's like, okay, um, well this is great. Layer that in with Ethereum and you can really do a lot of cool stuff. So um, towards the end of that year at the same time, uh, the Ujo team released, a collaborating team, global collaborating team released the image and heat prototype. This was the first use of smart contracts for dividing royalty payments. Um, you can see here we had different licenses, download license, stems, streaming, uh, sync policy, and a Sennheiser contract. Uh, at the time this was really cool, but it was also really cumbersome. Um, it had its own wallet, it was like clunky, um, and it was really, really graphic. So. Fast forward to 2016 and the music business, very susceptible to being disrupted, hence Napster was like, okay, what is this blockchain stuff? How can we actually get ahead of this? So the Open Music Initiative was created. Um, this was a cross industry global effort to explore inefficiencies in music supply chain uh, through, um, founded by Berkeley School of Music in Boston, uh, the United States, and uh, in, in collaboration with MIT and Intel. Um, there was a lot of members, there was over 200 members spanning both the tech side and the music business. Everyone from Jack, Chain, Resonate, Ujo, to like Spotify, uh, Pandora, the major three labels, and even like Red Bull Media was a part of this. Everyone was in this thing because blockchain was going to be the next big thing. Effectively, uh, we explored applications at the same time um, on our own, or Ujo did on their own for um, composition and recording database. It was a non-market fit at the time and fell short of what the full potential we saw was. Uh, I was like, great, we could build this for you, you can maintain the IP, but it misses the full point of what we wanna do with Ethereum. And that's more of like, yeah, we can migrate you into these new structures, build APIs, um, and make this all content addressable for you. Um, but we didn't really wanna do that. So we had a chicken and the egg problem. If, we, if we're not gonna build something for music and it's extremely expensive to license it, what are we gonna do? Because we can't demonstrate what we wanna do with music without it and we certainly can't enable any cool fan features without it either. So with the complexities of licensing music, um, bottlenecks eliminated end to end, like you know, if we're working for a PRO and they have to go through fiat and some paper trails to get to you know, like the Harry Fox agency or a label, um, it just didn't make sense. So 2017, uh, we drew a line in the sand. Whoa, that's, uh, that's 2018. 2017, line in the sand. Product segment and focus. Let's go after unencumbered musicians. There are so many musicians across the globe 
that don't have a label deal, don't have a publishing deal, and aren't even registered with the Performing Rights Society. These are those collecting societies. So what we did was we said, hey, look, this solves the chicken and the egg problem. It's not great. It's hard to maybe grow traction off of this segment, but it'll get us out in the market to experiment with some of our assumptions. So by building this, um, we were focused on people with you know, the idea that there's a, prolif a proliferation of digital instruments. So many people have digital instruments on their MacBooks right now, like in computers across the globe. So many people can upload music to SoundCloud. Um, you can make music, that, and, and there's music that's been made, um, that's made top 40 charts of Billboard with a literal laptop keyboard. Um, this to us was like a no-brainer. Okay, let's go after that segment just to experiment some of our assumptions against. Um, you know, combine that with like the writing and recording process, that, that difference of recording and composition, that's sort of been blurred and become intrinsic. If you're in Ableton, you're playing around with different instruments, effectively writing a song as you're also recording it. Rarely do those types of people ever send it to a, a studio to be mastered unless they actually get a label deal. So these, place, these people need services or infrastructure that serves them the security that they need as an individual creator. So in 2017, um, we started building that product, but this is many different pieces um, that we had been working on to date. Um, with the Qual IP, we built a JavaScript implementation. Uh, Alex Atar did that. We also built Constellate, which is an IPFS uh, file persistence layer. This will work with Swarm as well. Um, we did a lot of interviews and market research, basically just to do our own due diligence, uh, but we learned a lot um, through that. And we also released our private alpha of the creators portal, which was like super buggy and it was just a registration flow for artists at the time. It was only supply facing. There was nowhere to push your music to, but it used a lot of these open source and decentralized components that we were really excited about getting out there. Um, so then, yeah, fast forward to 2018. This is live, the creators portal. It's on Rink B Testnet right now. You can go to ujomusic.com, go and click try alpha and check this out. But effectively, it's an application level implementation of that ecosystem that we've been building towards. Um, it allows creators to register themselves associated with an Ethereum uh, address that they register with using MetaMask. They can register after registering themselves their music group and then they can register a release. This could be a single, this could be a full LP, what have you. Uh, but basically this just models um, current uh, copyright frameworks and licensing frameworks, but merging the recording and the composition. Um, right now it's on Rinkby, but um, you can go in as a single user, register a single music group, and uh, push as many releases as you want. Cool thing about that is that when you actually register your release, you can set different license policies for each. Right now, we're only offering a download license, which you can control the rate of. But in the future, this is a supply-side implement implementation of an ecosystem where many demand applications can come in and plug in and then de determine what kind of uh, additional licenses we offer. So the user is always going to maintain control, but you can actually go in and create many different licenses that can be picked up via a registry. So I'll get into that. but. Um, Right now on the Rink B testnet, we only allow one user to make up a music group. With our mainnet release in May, it's gonna be a multi-stakeholder music group enabled. So multiple people can comprise a music group, um, which you know finally realizes that vision of dividing payments immediately. So yeah, what are we currently using? Um, we're using Ethereum. Uh, we're using it for payment right now. We may or may not stick with that for the long term. We don't have a lot of traction, nor are we like prioritizing getting market traction. Again, this is just to validate a lot of like technical and UX assumptions we have. Um, so we're using Ethereum for licensing as well, um, which is pretty cool and something that like is really powerful. So with every purchase, we actually give a badge out, which is not effectively the license, but it's a signification of ownership of that digital download. And I will caveat the digital download. It's something we want to move away from, right? Because if a file goes offline, you don't know how many times it's being played. You lose a lot of the power that you have with Ethereum. But if like a Spotify plugs in and we have a stream license, then this is actually starting to become powerful. Uh, we're using IPFS. We're storing the metadata that we create in Koala IP on IPFS. Uh, we're pinning it up via Ethereum. Uh, we have Constellate for that. 
Um, we're using IPLD. We're not referencing anything via IPLD at this time, but we're basically putting CIDs on all of those different registrations because we're moving towards that like Merkelized forest that Juan Benet is known for um, terming. We're using MetaMask for wallet, um, and then obviously, you know, this is not all wholly decentralized. We're using AWS for um, storing and, and serving the site. So Simon made a good point. You know, this architecture uh, requires Ujo to exist at various places, indexing, payment, validation, and file disbursement. Um, Ujo provides the centralized components that are necessary for it to work at this point in time, but this is not something we want to do long term. Again, it gets us to market, but this is something that we really want to decentralize in, in the future as the space grows up. So yeah, what's that system look like? Um, we're gonna be announcing a lot of this stuff soon and open sourcing a lot of it. It's open source as it is, but we're not really publicizing it. But our creator and license registry, we're gonna have those uh, collectible tokens in places where you can actually have value for them. So applications that plug in and say, hey, you have that token, you purchased the fifth album of that artist, release, great, like I'll trade you at this, at this rate, or just a place to exchange them for not necessarily monetary value, but like social clout value. Um, indexing, searching API gateways, uh, this will be important and critical. We're doing some pretty cool stuff with porting over um, Discogs and Music Brains information, uh, which we'll be talking about in the future. Um, open law integration, open law is another consensus project, but basically dynamic uh, legal agreements. So in the actual interface, we're gonna be using um, all the information you put and that will actually create a legal agreement that we'll put on IPFS. Um, and then of course, that will be content addressable and we'll be issuing those to the purchasers when they purchase something as well. Um, and then there's gonna be applications cross platform. I think we're moving away from the supply chain that's linear with many, many intermediaries to a circular one with many, many on-ramps and off-ramps. And all this stuff just sits in the middle and it's maintained by Ethereum and decentralized architecture. So, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanna give a shout out to the whole Ujo team. Joe Lubin and everyone at Consensus um, and the asset team for organizing this. Uh, and just to wrap up, this technology from its inception has been incredibly inspiring. Um, what started with unique financing events for artists with Bitcoin was blown open with Ethereum. Um, the ways of funding, recording, distributing, and discovering music can now all be reimagined. Uh, with a balance of working with the existing players and experimenting with new ideas, um, we're heading towards a really exciting future. Thanks, guys.